hopefully everybody had a chance to use the restroom, grab another beverage, eat some mac and cheese. Um, so we will we'll keep this short here because we want to keep things moving for everybody and get back to this, uh, these good conversations. Um, uh, so my, my uh, section of the talk here is to talk about many of the questions that came up specifically throughout uh, about what our experiences were going into production. Uh, I thought this was going to be a 40 minute talk. It turned out to be much shorter, to be honest. You know, there were some things that went really well and some things that we ran into right away. Um, I want to caveat this. So we talked, Sid talked about what Sentry does. Um, we are you know, a crash reporting tool for uh, developers. Uh, many of the folks in the room here are developers. Who has heard of Sentry before? I'm going to go with. 50%, although most of you were employees, so <laughs> maybe closer to 25 to 30. Uh, very good. Um, I'm actually curious, so how many people are using Dataflow in or Beam in production? Oh, so everybody. Excellent. Most of everybody. This is very good. Um, so hopefully some of these experiences are relatable. Um, this may be redundant, but I'd, I'd like to keep this interactive. If you have something that you've experienced, Please let's let's make this a conversation. I'm I'm just up here sharing Sentry's perspective, but I'd love to learn from everyone else in the room. We're all in this together. We're all on call if you know things go down. So let's <laughs> let's learn from each other's experiences uh, and, and kind of treat it that way. Um, very good. So uh, essentially, the, the plan here is we'll go sort of problem by problem and then talk about the solution that we uh, that we put in place to deal with that. Um, one more caveat. So Sentry is a tool for developers to understand when your code breaks. Sentry is also open source, so by no means am I selling you something today. If it seems like I'm selling you something, to, you know, just keep in mind, Sentry is free. It is absolutely on, the whole product is on uh, GitHub, it's open source. So uh, as I talk about different ways that we have used Sentry to um, run Dataflow at Sentry, or run Beam at Sentry, uh, the intent here is not to sell you something, because it is free, so you can have it on your own. Um, so problem number one. Unexpected data in production. Uh, who has encountered this problem before? We're the only ones. <laughs> Excellent. So we have, uh, I think, a large team at this point. Uh, Century is over 100 employees. That means our uh, engineering staff is around 35 to 40. Uh, what we're finding as you know, a data team that is the subscribers uh, of data that is thrown from the rest of the Century system, uh, we don't have a lot of control over the quality of the data that comes in. Right? It is subject to what the other uh, you know, engineers in the organization are doing. Um, so we have seen changes, we learn more along the way. We get, you know, and in some ways Avro would, would help you know, solve this, uh, admittedly. Um, we have, I'll call it a religious predisposition to, to favor JSON and sort of the simplicity of being able to inspect the, the plain text data. Um, that said, there's certainly some advantages to using Avro uh, in our pipelines. I think it's more about the compatibility with exist, like other systems in Sentry and, and kind of favoring that, that approach. Um, of course, if schema changes happen, then it's, it's not just the input data we have to worry about, it's also as we're writing into BigQuery tables or other systems, uh, making sure that that schema is updated as well to reflect that new understanding. Um, so oftentimes when we're building systems, we're building data flow pipelines, we're iterating on a small data set because if we just plug six months of data into some of these pipelines, it would take a long time. It would be hard for us to iterate quickly. Um, and so what we found is that mistakes will be made. Um, and using the CDC example, if somebody did add a new column, how do we know? How do we, you know, something's gonna break, how, how do we deal with that? Uh, so here is an example from just my local laptop. Uh, this is the local data flow runner. This is the sort of um, debug information that you might get. Writing a string into an integer column. This is straight out of the word count example. We'll try to keep it light on the word word count examples. I see that a lot in streaming data. I think that we could probably reach for a, a better example, but let's just work with this for now. Um, so this is this is okay. This tells us exactly what went wrong, but that assumes that you're looking at the logs or you're getting the logs emailed to you, right? So if we look at Stackdriver, which is sort of the status quo, at least for data flow, um, as an execution uh, runner. You know, this is a sort of experience we pulled this from recently. Uh, so you, you have the stack trace on the right. Um, and this is, in my opinion, an improvement. You get a little bit more context here. Uh, you get this error count that tells you how frequently this happened, when it happened. Um, and this is certainly an improvement over the logs. Um, again, we work at a company that tries to make developers' lives easier. So we ask ourselves, what if uh, your pipeline told you when it broke 
instead of uh, you look, looking through the logs or getting an email from Stackdriver, as the case might be. Um, so I'm going to attempt a live example here. So we have uh, a Sentry integration that is, again, open source. The idea here is that you wrap your, how many, actually, let's take a step back. How many people are using Python to run Dataflow today, or Apache Beam pipelines? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to say that's 15%, <laughs> roughly. Uh, then we also have, who's using Java? Not quite everybody else. It's, who's using Scala, CO, or any of the other? Is there anybody that's running Dataflow not on Python or Java? <laughs> Golang, is that a thing? <laughs> Maybe. No one? I don't have a Golang solution. I can't help you there. No one, no one should probably be using Golang. Is there any developers for uh, Apache Beam here today? Oh, thank God. All right. So we can <laughs> move, let's move on. Uh, this video will probably go on the internet. So there's, the, you know, this is how it goes. So, so we have, I wanted to do a, a, try my hand at a live demo here. You know this is risky. Uh, so this is literally the uh, the WordPress uh, or the the, the um, I think it's the word count example, right? Is it? Maybe not. Yes. Can we see this? So it's basically generating random rows. It's defining a schema. Um, what we found is, especially in these CPC um, projects, we're writing custom transformations. So we're writing our own pardus and things like that. Um, what we would find is we make an error, and so. What we uh, attempted to do here is uh, add this Beam integration at the top where you initialize Sentry SDK. Uh, we add the Beam integration to get some additional details. And then here it comes. Let's, oh, I hope it works. I hope it happens. Let's give it a chance here. Oh, exception happened. So let's, let's see if we actually flip over and see. Uh, all right, so I cheated. This was from, from earlier. Let's see if we go, go here a few seconds ago. So we get some signal into Sentry, and what Sentry does is group this together. And we found this incredibly important as we got started. Uh, I'm not making this up. Sid was, uh, you know, it took us a long time, I think, to, to, to architect how this data flow needed to work. It took us a long time to understand um, the problem well enough to, to build the code. And then once we had this uh, and we started shipping bugs, this made our lives much easier. And I'm not trying to sell you something. I'm just trying to share our experience. Uh, you know, we found this to be a really useful way to iterate. And you can do this locally. You can even send like development, you know, create a separate project for a development environment, send your development as you're running like local, uh, you know, the data runner. Um, you can use this as a way to uh, very easily see into the stack trace, uh, understand what the individual um, values were at the point that the exception was raised. So you get, you know, insight into beyond just the stack trace. Um, you get some grouping so that this error comes back. Uh, you also get um, a variety of workflow things here where you do this as a release. You can say, okay, I fixed this bug. Tell me again if this comes back. Um, and you essentially get this, this full product experience that is built for JavaScript and Python and, and other you know, parts of the application stack. It hasn't traditionally been thought of as something that data engineers and data scientists might reach for. So what we try to do is make this accessible for ourselves because we were very much scratching our own edge. Um, so jumping back into this, so it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? You like pip install this and, and you're sort of off to the races. Um, so we also have this for the Java SDK. It's a little bit more manual where you have to inject this into your pardo functions or re essentially inject this try accept. Uh, there's a little bit less flexibility in terms of um, yeah, how we can, within the constraints of the JVM, capture, capture these exceptions, but still useful. Um, we use this as well for uh, just to validate some of the some of the tagging here that can tell you uh, more about the like you know the state of the window when this uh, exception happens and some additional context to help you understand um, who this is affecting and why. Uh, there is also again so there's there's some like workflow built into this where if you know that this is definitely Sid's fault and almost is always Sid's fault. I'm sorry, there's just not a lot of people that work on data flow here at Sentry. So, uh, but if you have a bigger team, you can use some of that workflow to say this bug is your bug, and um, you can even set up some of the uh, get integrations so that you can say, not only is it probably Sid's fault, it's also a commit that Sid made yesterday that affected this line. So, um, some interesting possibilities there. Uh, so this was, you know, the solution essentially ended up being uh, we can react more quickly to when schema uh, schema changes happen. Uh, so then we had a second problem: dropping data. Uh, as I was putting this talk together, you know, this was related to the schema errors. We would have a schema error, and then Beam would keep plowing forward. Who has encountered this before? 
do folks. So this was something I didn't realize that was a default. Um, so we, we, we saw, we were having to understand what Beam was in the, you know, just wrapping our heads around watermarks, trying to wrap our heads around um, the behavior of Beam itself. And so when we saw that Beam was progressing uh, and, and you know, it seemed like things were going along correctly, but then we were missing rows, we were confused. Um, in our case, we didn't have a way to replay. We have essentially like only a couple days of data that's available in Kafka. So by the time we realized this, the data is already no longer available, we're sort of beyond the window of time where we had uh, lost data when we were initially uh, rolling this out. <clears throat> so this is all to say that um, Beam offers a lot of you know flexibility in terms of things like retry options, especially related to BigQuery. Um, we did not realize this at the time. Uh, it's looking at the BigQuery error message to determine whether something is a transient error, which means maybe you got a 503 from BigQuery, or it's a permanent failure, and it treats those differently. Um, this is the set of words that it's looking for in the error message to make a determination of which one which one it is. Uh, so there's there's four four models that you can follow for dealing with retries in BigQuery. Uh, always retry. Um, I thought that would be the default at the time. Uh, this is always retry all failures. Uh, never retry is sort of the YOLO, just keep moving on. We're just going to keep you know, progressing as far as we can. Uh, retry transient errors. Um, this is the one that says if we know that it's a 503 error, then uh, those we will retry. But if we know that it's like a 404, like a, a different status code, um, or one of those words is, is in there, then um, it sort of permanently moves past that row and pro uh, processing continues. Uh, so should we try, I didn't realize about this one, so you have the ability to write a custom function yourself that will give you the flexibility to determine um, whether the retry should happen or not. It goes beyond just uh, one of these sort of hardline always or never policies. So in the process of writing this talk, I thought, oh, I'm going to throw Beam under the bus, we're going to talk about how it has such a terrible default. Turns out they fixed this bug <laughs> since we encountered this uh, months ago. Uh, so they, this is they sort of uh, the team recognized within the Python SDK in particular. I think that this was um, an unsafe default to have retry transient errors as the uh, starting point. So uh, my suggestion, based on our learning experience, is to if you're you know if you're using this sort of functionality, to consider what your retry philosophy is. Um, in this case, there were logs that were going into Stackdriver. We didn't see them. We weren't paying attention. We didn't realize that this was happening. Uh, we just assumed that we were getting most of the data. That it must be good. Um, so, of course, there's another possibility, which is you can consider sending your errors to a third-party service. I'm not saying which one is a good choice. Uh, there, there are options. Um, poor performance, problem number three. I think we all laugh at this. Uh, so the Python data flow pipeline required a ton of machines for this. I was quite alarmed when Sid said, uh, we have this working, but also it's going to take 64 like N1 standard 4 nodes to process the data. Um, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with the GCP pricing, but uh, that was a lot. Um, we also had challenges with crashing. So for no for reasons we couldn't figure out, maybe this is fixed in more recent more recent releases of the Python SDK. Uh, every few hours to every few days, um, without a specific error message, um, it seemed that processing just hump. Um, so we opened a support ticket. Um, you know, this was back in November. We had some feedback that you could uh, do like a, a thread dump of the JVM to try to figure out where things were stuck. Um, you know, at, at that point, we decided to hard pivot into the Java SDK anyway, so we really didn't make much progress here. So if you're encountering this, I suggest considering the Java SDK. <laughs> uh, so we have this great chart. Um, this is from the GCP billing uh, portal. <laughs> Our CFO is extremely excited about this. Uh, I don't want to tell you the specific order of magnitude of the dollars on the right. Those are conveniently trimmed out. You can actually do the math to figure it out. Uh, but it's quite the same improvement moving from the Python SDK that we were running in October and November into finally in December we made the transition to the Java SDK. We found that it was 90% uh, more efficient to use the Java SDK. Uh, and so here you have like the data flow uh, or sorry, the, uh, the data dog uh, version of this as well. We're, we, we dump all the GCP metrics. They have like an integration where you can put all the stuff into uh, the data dog. So uh, pretty compelling, pretty compelling. Uh, I should reiterate, this is a line by line. Um, we, we, had, we worked with SpringML for this actually, if anybody's worked with them, if you need consulting services. Uh, they helped us uh, do this rewrite into, into Java based on, on their experience. It was literally a line by line translation. So there was no additional tweaks to the code, no additional 
like performance enhancements or, or anything. It was literally a line by line translation from Python to Java. Um, could not be more straightforward, and that was that was the difference in our experience. Who has experienced something similar with the Python SDK? Has anybody else hit this? Yeah. Did you have a similar experience for you? Yeah, so it wasn't me specifically, but our team originally wrote the pipeline that I'm working on in Python. Yeah. And then it just hung all the time, and they, and they rewrote it in Java. So I, sailing. So I remember them telling me that like there was a bug open, and eventually it got fixed, so nowadays yeah. it shouldn't happen. But it's all third hands. So. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, I, so we. Maybe taking a step back, there was a question: Why did we reach for the Python SDK? You know, Sentry Sentry has been around since 2010. It's a Django app. Um, you know, for a long time, Python has been what we reached for first. Uh, and so we thought, hey, that's great. They have a Python SDK. Let's start with that. Um, I think we understood that the Python runtime is maybe less performant than the Java JVM version. We didn't expect it to be <laughs> this significant. Um, so I think that there is like, aside from throwing Python under the bus, which is, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, but in this case I'm okay with it. Um, there are some potential explanations for why. I was trying to find some more detailed research here. Um, part of this is informed by the data flow integration that we built within the Sentry SDK. I didn't realize this, but they do some, in the Python SDK, the team is using some of the inspect modules functionality of Python to understand when you're calling a function, what the uh, function signature looks like, what are the arguments and the keyword arguments. Um, that's a pretty slow, it can be a slow module to use, so that I think there's some aspect of that. I think there's, of course, the, uh, the, the GIL, the, the and JVM's natural ability to execute threads and, and you know, proper parallelism. I think that could be a big factor here as well. Um, so I'd love to know more about why, why we're seeing this difference. If anybody has thoughts or uh, knows the team, that would be um, interesting to know um, going forward. So, final problem here. We'll keep it. We'll keep it brief. So, th this observability idea. Um, we're we're certainly big on this. Uh, it's it's the ability to know um, how something is functioning based on things that you can measure about a process. Um, you know, so that might be you know some of these metrics that we're sending to to uh, Datadog. Um, Stackdriver has some pretty. Uh, they've been working on this, and it's it's getting a lot better. I think recently to give you better insight into what metrics are, are available to uh, at least your, your um, data flow beam pipeline. We favor Datadog, it is more expensive, so if you're trying to you know, pinch pennies and, and you know, there's a certain, there's definitely cost to using Datadog, um, but we found that to be more effective in terms of um, you know, creating alerts and telling us when things are, are not going well. Um, so this was new, I didn't realize this was part of data flow, at least this was new to me, that you can, um, you can set some pretty specific alerts about uh, within Stackdriver, telling you, uh, you know, if, if things drop below a certain threshold, you can, um, you know, uh, fire off an email. Um, so that's that's uh, exciting. I think that there is a much uh, more exciting future for uh, Beam and all data pipelines related to, to APM. Um, so APM has always meant like application performance monitoring. Traditionally, it's been JavaScript mobile apps that uh, think about this sort of thing. But I actually think the concepts are just as applicable to um, streaming data pipelines as well. Uh, again, in the process of preparing this talk, I thought, why don't I Google to see what the latest and greatest is? And of course, Google has announced seven days ago uh, <laughs> that Stackdriver now has uh, observability APM-like features that are available as part of it itself. Um, has anybody played with this? Anybody seen this? Yeah. Is it pretty good? Yeah, it's nice. Good. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> so, so it gives you some more detail of, as far as like function level. Um, I'd be curious to hear your experience. Can you like if you write your own Pardo, does that help you see kind of what inside the Pardo is is like what things are, are slow within that step of the pipeline? Down to the transform level. Cool. Well, okay. You can also attach a profiler. Oh, sure. Yeah. You can go into it. Um, yeah. So that's a good point. So you can you can attach to the Stackdriver profiler so that you can get more visibility into what it is that's slow in, in a sort of a live executing pipeline. I, I think that that's specific to the JVM, I believe. Is that right? That's all we've ever tried. Yeah, to yeah. Uh, that's what I've seen as well. Um, so look, I, I think that this is something that it's not just you know Google. It's not just us. A lot of folks are thinking about APM, and I think that what's interesting is what does what will APM mean for us, data engineers and data scientists that are trying to understand how things are working and, and um, we actually have uh, 
you are here from Toro Data, who is kind of taking a similar uh, or a different approach to understanding um, when data is in motion, when it ends up in, uh, in its destination um, data warehouse, being able to write assertions about data and, and asserting data quality. So I think this is uh, like a really, it feels to me like it's sort of a hot space. I think there's a lot of activity here. Um, so we have our own flavor here, which I of course want to share with you. <laughs> Uh, so Sentry is working on an APM solution that is, again, tailored specifically for JavaScript and Python um, sort of servers. But it actually, I, I took a pull the screenshot from what we've done with Airflow. How many people use Airflow or have used Airflow in their roles? So maybe, yeah, maybe a little less than half. So this is, uh, it's a different space, but um, there's some similarities in terms of how you have like steps of a pipeline that run. Um, so the, the Sentry APM solution that we're building will help you give that level of granular introspection into when you have a function that's running slowly, can you understand why? Is it a specific database query? Is it a service that you're hitting that's slow? Um, why is something slow that was fast yesterday? Is it the data that's changed or is it something else? Um, so what we're gunning for is this level of uh, granularity within a, within a beam pipeline. Um, so this is still very early days for us in terms of building this out within Dataflow or within Beam. Um, but the idea being that you could do this sort of drill in to see what are the queries that are slow, what are the you know, external service calls that might be slow. Um, you know, it, it, it sort of is case by case on how, how applicable this might be for, for your use case. Um, but we're finding this already very interesting for Airflow and I expect that we'll find this um, equally as compelling for our Dataflow work as well. Um, so, uh, you know, to that end, there's a lot of exciting things happening here related to data engineering, data uh, scientists work. Um, this is something that is more of a prototype for us today that we want to do more with. Um, we're of course hiring as everybody's hiring uh, in the city of San Francisco and the surrounding Bay Area. Um, I did want to offer this up, uh, you know, Beam 2020, if you want to give, you, many of you may actually have Sentry already on, uh, in your organization. Uh, we have upwards of um, tens of thousands of paid customers. It's very likely that your company already uses us. Um, so you can uh, you know, get the benefit of getting 50 bucks free here if you want to give us a shot. Um, happy to, to talk more about that if that's something that you're interested in. So uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions here. Um, does anybody have comments, questions? Share your own experience? Yeah. I'm just curious in your Python SDK experience in being, if you had tried to join two different programs together. trying to think. We did not. I think it was just a pretty straightforward like transformation. Um, is that what you found was particularly slow or uh, the no, shuffle? It's just, mm. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a, you know, try, try to knock, knock on another door. <laughs> yeah. No, we didn't hit that. Although I, I will say like to their credit, I think the, the Python SDK has evolved quite a bit since we, we were using it a few months ago. And even in that time frame, I think it's the feature completeness is, is improved quite a bit. Yeah, you uh, or, So going back to the Python versus Java thing, yeah. I'm a Java fanboy, so this might come off wrong, but um, I used I wrote a lot of Spark back in the day, yeah. and Java, or Scala if you prefer, for uh, Spark was much more performant, and mainly because you could actually look into what it's doing I found uh, Python Spark, uh, Spark to be very difficult to look into and understand why, what's going wrong there. Well, aside from your actual Spark measures. Yeah. Can I ask you this? So, I think in your experience, um, did your company also use PySpark at the same time, or did you? Um, I so I used to work at Uber. Um, yes, at some point, somebody, somebody there was some organization used PySpark. Yeah. Um, uh, my team, I pretty much said no Java. Uh, we only use Java and no Python. I said that got us a long way in terms of uh, scaling our data process. Cool. Sweet. Anybody else have a production experience they want to share? We can we can make this into a support group here. You know, let's, let's, let's just work through this together. <laughs> I guess a one comment yeah. in the Python SDK. So yeah. Python SDK, like most, lots of Python modules that are really important for the SDK. There's like a Python version available that's much faster than the Python version. So when we first started using the Python SDK, like we compiled our own package. Yeah. I didn't build the Python modules. It was really, really slow. Uh, once we fixed this and made sure that we have the Python optimizations, like oh, the speed of was really, really significant compared to the Python version. 
Mm-hmm. I see. You're saying Saipan? Like the, yeah. This, yeah, I gotcha. Okay. So if you put in a bead from PyPyArc, um, uh-huh. it should be already there. Interesting. So you usually really don't put my, my packages from PyPyArc, so if you build it yourself, yeah. you need to make sure that you have to sign the I see. And you were running this on Dataflow, or this was on? <coughs> uh, no, we have our own uh, 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 beam setup. Oh, ah, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I just wonder what the limitations would be for if, if you could just, yeah, it, it depends on the execution. Cool. I've heard that there are a lot less issues with the batch ah. you know, Dataflow. Yeah. Python SDK. Ah, I see. <coughs> that makes sense. Um, it's so like yeah, you guys have any experience with that? So we took a look, and, and since we sort of touched on this, is that we, I think we had a dream which was, could we write a Beam SQL streaming job and then use that same Beam SQL job to backfill old data? So start streaming the new data in and then use that exact same pipeline Literally, the, like running Beam SQL or whatever the case might be, to to write the historic data using the batch, like sort of that mode. Um, we didn't find it to be something that was quite as easy as sold, <laughs> maybe when we first thought. Has anybody else had success with that? I don't know. Curious. Um, yeah, so we, it, it turned out to be more challenging than just writing SQL for us. So we just we went on that. Interesting. Yeah. Can you comment on your guys' path to choosing? Uh, cloud data flow and at this point like are you guys happy with that decision yeah that's a great question um i would say back in the day we weren't super rigorous about some of these decisions it was like try this and then before you know it it's actually production <laughs> yeah, you know um so i think for us we we have another great blog but we're just really talking about the blog a lot today um blog.century.io check it out uh, we have a great uh, blog post about how we were on st- uh, uh, bare metal with software, and then we made the, the plunge into GCP. I think what was exciting to me was both the dual, you know, the, the dual batch and streaming uh, functionality, which we haven't frankly taken that much advantage of. Um, but then also that it was a data flow. Uh, data flow felt baked into GCP, and because we were all in on GCP, it felt like a natural modern, dare I say. Uh, uh, emerging, uh, you know, a hot, a hot choice for us to, to use. I also like the flexibility that if we needed to move to Spark, we could, in theory, take the same pipeline and, and run it there too. More flexibility. Does anybody else have a different take on how they made, made again, turning this into a support group? <laughs> how did you end up with? <laughs> is that a similar story? Maybe it is. I was just thinking, did you evaluate like? Yeah, so in this case, we so we use Kafka definitely within the app because uh, it's open source. Um, we have, Part of what we have to think about is for the folks who decide to run basically a Docker image of Sentry in their laptop or within various large tech companies in the Bay Area, um, they, have, they would have, I think it's a lot easier for us to tell that story of just you run this other open source project, Kafka. Um, so, you know, specifically with Confluent and like some of the paid versions of their products, I think we sort of straight away to that and tried to fav- favor an open source project where we can. Um, but still a good question about why, you know, why not Spark, for example, because it has all the same properties. Yeah? How do you do um, updates to a pipeline? So, because you can do without a flow screen, you can just yeah. say, hey, update it. And if your change is like small enough, then it'll update it happily. Otherwise, we'll just reject your update. So what do you, what do, you do then? So I know they have the template stuff. Um, so we haven't really explored that too much. Um, yeah, do you want to jump in? Yeah. I, I kill it, drain it, and restart it. Just manually. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, yeah. this, this, this upsets me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we do the same, right? <laughs> no one in the world runs their web applications like this, where it's like, oh yeah, occasionally we just have to like manually yeah. update it. Like everyone has like rolling updates is a thing. That's yeah. like a technology that's really well established. And then in data flow streaming, they're like, oh, occasionally you just have to get in the weeds and like press some buttons or run some commands manually. Yeah. Uh, and I talked with the data flow, like, some of the data flow team that can do training where we work and like. They didn't have a good answer either. Interesting. So just yeah. like, it's kind of how it is. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> because, of, because of reasons to do with aggregations across watermarks and keeping things consistent. And, yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say, um, so my experience, 
I, I came to Dataflow through Las Vegas. Uh, I met Austin in, in Las Vegas, who's organized all these meetups and, and does a great job. I think what was exciting to me about that was the maintainers are super accommodating. And um, I don't know about the training experience, but at least when you're in the room with the, the Google folks and everybody else who's working on Dataflow as an open source project, um, I think we actually brought up this transient error thing, and it was the same guy that I talked to in, in Las Vegas who fixed, uh, fixed that bug. So. Um, I will say that uh, I think to their credit, uh, where they recognize there's a lot of opportunity, I think they're they're accommodating. I think they they would welcome that feedback, and uh, maybe next time we'll, we'll get the the contributors in here so we can, you know, <laughs> make sure that feedback is heard loud and clear. We'll send them this video. How about that? That's, that's just <laughs> here you go. Um, but yeah, it's, it's in that regard. I think there's there's still some room for improvement for sure. But you have the same yeah. problem with Flink, for example, right? You can't easily update the job or data flow job if you're changing the pipelines and right. right. so it's not just a data flow specific thing. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah. I was hoping it would be done in different ways. Yeah. Cool. I mean it's open source so as they say, pull requests accepted, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. So that's that's pretty much what we had. I I would want